Excellent. I wanted to take a step back and um, and think about the open access movement um, and some of the if we if we go back and look at um, at open access as we see it today. Um, we're faced with these these, these papers, and um, that that's not what this talk is about. So, um, if we ask the question, open access to what? Uh, if um, open access to to papers, we, um, this is from a letter um, from Benjamin Franklin in 1753, you could call it the beginning of the, the open access movement. Um, he says, my thoughts, my dear friend, are many of them crude and hasty, and if I were merely ambitious of acquiring some reputation in philosophy, I ought to keep them by me till corrected and improved by time and farther experience. But since even short hints and imperfect experiments in any new branch of science being communicated have oftentimes a good effect in exciting the attention of the ingenious. You are at liberty to communicate this paper to whom you please. There, there's the permission there. Um, it being of more importance that knowledge should increase than that your friend should be thought an accurate philosopher. So there, there's a, in, in this, I feel there's a sense of urgency, and it's not about the paper, but it's about the knowledge. And he wants it shared so that people can as many people as possible can benefit from the, the knowledge that he obtained. And as, as we, as scholars or scientists, researchers, um, produce research output, um, what we call it, um, are we thinking about how can I maximize, how can I help as many people as possible in the world to, to use this knowledge in the way they need to? Um, or is it so I can um, meet the requirements of my grant proposal and um, so I can keep getting money? The, um, is there a way that we could do more? So um, open access to knowledge is really um, to understand a piece of knowledge, we need to understand where it came from, not as much so that the person that wrote it can receive credit for it, but so that we can understand the context in which the knowledge was created. And um, there are many different fields and many um, specific vocabularies and concepts that um, that knowledge is encompassed. Um, but we need, to un we need to have ways to take a piece of knowledge to trace back how it came about uh, so that other people can learn um, and so that, so that they can then create new knowledge from their specific point of view. Uh, and then, um, so this is kind of a step. Right now, we're, we have open access to literature. A lot of, that's, that's what we're talking about. We, the next step is open access to knowledge. Um, creating those, and, and a lot of those things may be based on what um, has been mentioned previously, the semantic um, relations and um, And the um, and all of that is great, but we need a way to engage people in um, in this knowledge work, and that that's that's kind of the third step that that I see in in my vision of what um, where where knowledge creation could go, and the. Um,
So um, Margaret Wheatley, she, she wrote a book on um, leadership, actually, not, not scholarship. But um, so uh, what she is saying is, is in the traditional sense, we leave the analysis of data to the experts. Um, and um, in the second paragraph, she says, it would seem that the more participants we engage in this par participative universe, the more we can access its potentials and the wiser we can become. We banish the ghost of this ghostly universe by engaging in a different pattern of behavior, one in which more and more of us are included in the process of observing what is going on and contributing our unique interpretations. So um, what we are, <clears throat> there's, there, there's a lot to get there. And how do we get there to this idea of um, many people engaging in knowledge creation and um, learning? There's, um, So something that um, that we need to have as part of this transition um, to to the uh, machine understandable research that we've talked about is a, it's really a social um, environment where anyone can feel like they can um, not only have access to the literature but have the ability to um, to learn and engage with the experts and um, we're at a place where they feel safe anyone um, experts feel safe that their expertise is not going to be ignored or um, overturned or overruled by um, by people that are louder than they are and a place where um, the non-experts, the the curious, can come and um, and feel like they can learn at their own speed and participate in ways that they uh, feel comfortable with. So um, this kind of idea is 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 the scholarly commons, um, and it's it's taking a lot of the tools that we have, but it's creating new ways to interact with these tools and infrastructure to be able to um, to engage people. So um, a big part of this in, in our research has been looking at um, the importance of questions and um, how we can bring and make questions a more um, integral and uh, part of the research process. Um, questions invite participation and they invite others of any skill level to to ask and answer um, I wanted to to mention a little bit about the um, I'm I'm in the I'm not as much a researcher as I'm from the the open source software community so uh, looking at the the, the open source culture as a way, as a model of what the um, open knowledge community or the scholarly commons could be is really instructive. Um, at the beginning of the open source culture, there was a lot of, like open source was a religion, and there were a lot of religionists that would um, promote this stuff, but it was really hard to get involved on your own. So um, now with, with tools like GitHub and um, and Git and other um, things, S developers are able to um, to interact in many different ways that are very easy, and that's what what I hope to see um, in the scholarly commons. So, um, this picture of a cat it says the scholarly commons are best. But okay, thank you.